Welcome back to the Pursuit Podcast. Before we get started, I want to first say thank you to our sponsor, Nexamo. Nexamo not only allows us to keep operating this podcast, but they also supply developers with APIs for SMS, voice, authentication, and a lot of other really interesting tooling for developers. If you want to find out more about what they do, hop to nexamo.com. If you want to thank them for sponsoring the podcast, say hi to them at Twitter at Nexamo Dev. I'm your host, Jessica Rose. I'm here today with... Hey, this is VM Brasur, but because we're all friends here, you can call me Vicky. Vicky, we're going to be chatting today about how to make contributions to open source. And I think that you may now be like the official expert for this. Is there a reason? Well, I... I don't know that expert is really the right word. I mean, people have been doing this for decades now, but I am the first person to write a book on it. So there's a book all about how to contribute to open source. It's wonderful. But I can call you an expert. That's, that, that feels fine. <laughs> you can be mock, I'll just push and be like, oh, wow, Vicky's fantastic. I'm the person to know in this space. Can you tell me a little bit about the book? So you say it's the first book written about how to contribute to open source. Yeah, there are lots of articles out there and even some blog posts, and obviously there's going to be some tech conference videos on it, but nobody has ever looked at the entire landscape of free and open source software contributions and consolidated it into a one-stop shop in a book form. So you don't have to go all over the web looking for the documentation on how to do a mailing list or how to format an issue or any of that stuff. It's all in one spot now in this book. And I was really surprised at first to learn that this book didn't exist yet, but that's free and open source software, right? That's just the way we do things. So let's touch on some of these things. How should I format an issue? So issues are very, very important. We should think of them a lot like a laboratory notebook. Okay. So it's not just there for you to report a bug. It's also there to collect all of the information about researching the bug and duplicating it. You can write everything in the issue and then hand it off to someone else should you get busy, should you have to go take care of your children or go to school or attend a conference. Adding a lot of information to the issue is something that we tend to be pretty bad about in a lot of technology, and it really bites us in the butt. So these sound like things that you've sort of developed a knowledge of through your work with open source. Can you talk to us a little bit about your background and how you sort of fell in love with open source in the first place? I've been in love with open source since before open source was a thing. I don't know how many people know this, but the term open source software is 20 years old today. Oh, I know. Happy birthday, open source. Happy birthday, open source. So 20 years ago, the open source initiative was created to help free and open source software. Before that, there was open source software, but to help expand the reach of the entire movement, another name was picked to try to appeal to more people, to reach out to more people and help them understand what it was all about. Plus the word free in free software, it got kind of confusing for people because in English, as we all know, if we speak English, the word free has multiple meanings. So we don't have to pay for it, right? Well, yes, but there's a lot more behind the word freedom. And that's what free software is really about. I got involved very early on, and I actually came at the ethos of free and open source software through culture. So I came at it through Project Gutenberg way back in the early 90s. Project. Oh, and for those who might not be familiar with Project Gutenberg... Project Gutenberg is amazing, and it's been around for decades now. And they take public domain texts and make them available on the web in a very easy-to-access form. Very, very early on, I was reading texts of Lewis Carroll's books through Project Gutenberg, and I just thought it was a wonderful, wonderful service. And through that, I started to discover the ethos of sharing that comes with free and open source software. Free software was already in the works, but Linux didn't exist yet. And so I didn't know a lot about free software, but I started learning about it thanks to groups like Project Gutenberg. And then later, Internet Archive, which I believe came around 1996, I believe. I just remembered what I was doing in 1996, probably making really trash websites that I bet I could look up on the Internet Archive. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes, the archive is wonderful for kind of uh, this accidental backup of things you might otherwise lose on the web. If you go to Internet Archive, you can search all of those horrible websites you created when you were a teenager. But also the archive has just this wonderful collection of texts themselves. So they have millions of books that you can check out on openlibrary.org. And they have movies and they have the largest collection of live music recordings in the entire world. And they have now this massive collection of 78 records that they have digitized. And it's just wonderful. You can just get lost in the internet archive for hours and video games. They now emulate classic video games and you can play them on the web. I'm sold. I can absolutely see how you fell in love. It's hard not to. It's just, there's just so much amazing content there that you can't find anywhere else. It also is a great place to save things that you're working on now. For instance, anytime I publish an article, I then take the URL for that article and I go to web.archive.org and I drop that URL in the little field and I click the save now button and instantly Internet Archive will crawl my article and it will save it for posterity. And I know should anything ever happen to the website that published my article, I will always be able to access it. This is also great for tweets, for instance. You can drop a tweet URL in there. These things just never go away now. Thank you, Internet Archive. <laughs> Thank you or ah, depending on your perspective. Well, yes, it, it is a matter of perspective, but I'm grateful for it. So let's say our dear listener is somebody who's not in the same kind of boat as you. They've they've heard a lot about open source. They've had to think about maybe contributing, but they haven't fallen in love the way you have, and they haven't followed through. We're going to give them a little verbal nudge live on air. What sort of things would you start with to say, okay, well, it's not so hard or it's really exciting? What's the, I hate to say it, but elevator pitch? Oh, I'm so bad at elevator pitches. I have so many words to use. Um, what the book is about, it is about how to contribute to open source software. But the first couple chapters are why. Oh, so why? Well, I mean, it can do amazing things for you and your career, but you have to know what you want to get out of it. Because otherwise, you will just go out and jump in the very first project you come across and try to contribute and it won't be something that will do anything for you personally or for your career. And so the second chapter, I believe, goes through all the many different benefits that you can get from contributing to free and open source software. And the chapter after that is all about how to select the right project for you. I can almost guarantee the right project is not going to be contributing to the Linux kernel, which is where a lot of people jump immediately because it is one of the best known free and open source projects. But there are millions of projects out there on every topic under the sun. And one of the wonderful things about free and open source software is that it's not just for coders. You don't have to be a programmer to contribute. And this book does not focus on the programming side of contribution, it focuses on the entire 360 degree view. In order to make successful software, you need so much more than coders. You do need documentarians and designers and project managers and people to help organize events and marketing. Holy crap, most projects need so much marketing, but we haven't done a good job in open source software in reaching out to these people of other skill sets and making them feel welcome and showing them how it can be done. And that's what I hope this book will help is to start to include so many more people in free and open source software because we need them. We really do. And that sounds like it very much mirrors what you were talking about when we when we started, where you said, oh, do you know what? Contributing to free software can do so much for you yourself professionally, so much for your goals. And it sounds very much as though writing this book gave you the opportunity to sort of chase some of your larger goals in the industry and say, hey, let's look how we can build a bigger tent in open source software. Oh, yeah. It's one of the problems we have with free and open source software is, for the most part, it has been by programmers for programmers. And that's great, but there are so many other people in the world. And if we want to help spread the ethos of free and open source software, we need to speak to those people. And we can't do that if we're only for programmers by programmers. So if we are able to get more people who are can help with free and open source software 
who can do UI design, who can do usability studies, who can do accessibility studies, who can translate things to other languages. These are the types of people, among others, obviously, but this is the sort of thing that if we can get these folks involved, that's a win right there. What they can bring to free and open source software makes that software itself more available to more people. And then we can start meeting people where they are rather than expecting them to learn how to program and learn how to read code rather than documentation just to contribute, just to understand what free and open source software is about. So including more people will help us spread the mission and the message of free and open source software to more. This is fantastic. So I kind of want to get a little bit of a sneak peek behind the book and sort of poke at a little bit what these different chapters have. I'm not going to make you sort of give away the whole plot right away, but you mentioned that participating in and contributing to open source software can be great for your career. Can you talk to me a little bit about what kinds of things people might be able to expect or might be able to try and get out of participation in open source software? So for instance, let's say you're a student. It doesn't matter of what. And in your projects for your student, for your learning, your coursework, you may have to learn how to do certain things with code or certain things with CSS or what have you, but you don't actually learn how to collaborate very well. You might have one or two projects where you work together as a group, but that's not really what collaboration is like. That's a forced construct of collaboration. As you participate in free and open source software, you get to learn how to work on a team, but not just any team, a team of globally distributed people. And that is very useful in this day and age as more and more companies are starting to embrace a distributed workforce. You don't learn how to operate on a distributed workforce in university. You don't learn often how to do very good things with version control. You don't learn how to write good test coverage. You don't learn how to do a lot of usability studies. So there are many things you can learn in free and open source software that you don't learn elsewhere. If you learn these things in free and open source software, you don't have to wait until you learn them on the job. You can learn them in advance of the job. And then you can get up to speed and get a jump on a lot of people who otherwise would be there in front of the queue with you to get a new job. But you have a head start on them because you've contributed to open source software. It also gives you this amazing portfolio. Now, your GitHub, your GitLab, those profiles, they are not your resume, but they can be a very good portfolio. And it's a portfolio that is entirely unencumbered by copyright problems. And that's something that a lot of folks in our industry don't consider. You can't just take code you wrote for a previous job or documentation you wrote for a previous job and use it in your portfolio without express written permission. Because things you write for your job, that copyright belongs to that company. It does not belong to you. You do not have the right to share it. With free and open source software, you get that copyright. You can do whatever you need to with it, thanks to that copyright and the licensing of free and open source software. So you can show people legally what you're able to do in a way that you can't with the things that you do at the office, because it's illegal to share that stuff. So sort of a great combination of giving you the opportunity to learn that great thing that's going to be really valuable, and then the opportunity to show that off. Say, hey, I learned this thing. Let me show you what I did. Yeah, exactly. And you also get to learn a lot of technology that you wouldn't in university or perhaps on the job. For instance, if you're very interested in learning the latest JavaScript framework, but you don't use it on the job, you can go to that framework and you can contribute to it. And then you can learn that framework and it can help you learn the technology you need to get a new job, a better job, one that is going to take you in the direction you want your career to go. Because it is your responsibility to take care of and manage your career. It's not the responsibility of your manager, although they should be helping you. It's yours when you get right down to it. So where do you want your career to go? Ask that, answer that first, and then look and see what free and open source projects out there can help you get to your goal. I'm absolutely sold. I imagine our dear listener is equally sold. What's the next step? How do I, how do I start looking for it? Where do they live? 
Oh, they live all over the place. Everyone will tell you to just go to GitHub. And while GitHub is a very, very large, what we call forge, a code forge, it's not the only one. You can go to GitLab, you can go to Bitbucket, you can go to the Apache Software Foundation, Eclipse Software Foundation. There are so many different places where you can find a free and open source project. And that's kind of a problem because you end up with this paralysis as you look at all of these options. So I recommend people limit their options by considering what do I want to work on? You've got the goals that you've been considering for your career, but goals are one thing. You also need to remain interested. Otherwise, you won't be engaged. To remain interested, you should work on something that will be very interesting to you, like, say, something related to a hobby. If you do sewing, for instance, the free sewing project or Valentina, these are projects that are related to sewing and pattern making, and they are free and open source software, and you can contribute to them. For knitting and 3D printing and hardware and cars, there's really interesting projects out there related to automotives. So there's lots of really great projects out there. So I recommend people list their goals, their interests, and finally, their constraints. Okay. Yeah, if you only know things in a certain programming language, then, okay, that's a possible constraint. If you only have a few hours a week because you're a single parent working a job and going to school, well, that's also a constraint. And it's very important to be aware of your constraints and try to choose based upon all of these things, your goals, your interests, and your constraints. Because otherwise you might pick something that is just going to be very frustrating for you. It won't get you where you're trying to go. It won't be interesting and it will be too much work or otherwise just very difficult for you. So these are things that you should consider as you're looking for your first project. So you've mentioned a lot that are, are very, very positive. Look for what fits your, the amount of time you have. Look what fits your goals. Are there any red flags where if I or you or our dear listener is looking at an open source project, what should make them run? Uh, things that you should make you run. If there is no documentation, and that's really any type of documentation, how to set up a developer environment or how to install the software or user docs. Very often there are no user docs. And this can make it very, very difficult for you to contribute. You will have to spend a lot of time talking to people just to even get set up and running. So that's one red flag. Another red flag is a project that does not have a contribution guide. It's often called contributing, just that word, or contributing.txt or .markdown. And the projects that have a contributing guide, they have gone to that extra step to help make people feel welcome. They have written this guide. It might be a very short guide, but they've tried, right? And that's a good sign. Projects without a contributing guide probably don't want external contributors. And finally, if you are interacting with people and they are rude to you, then leave. Just leave. Yeah, you don't have time for that. You don't have time for that. Uh, a lot of projects are getting a lot better at this now. And a great number of projects now are both adopting and enforcing codes of conduct in their project to make sure that everyone can feel welcome and safe in that space. So if a project does not have a code of conduct, you might want to see whether there is another project option out there for you. Because you don't want to be in a space where people are going to cut you down and make you feel bad. And a code of conduct can help protect against that sort of thing. Because at the end of the day, you're doing free work. Yeah. Yes, you are. You are. I mean, you are obviously getting something out of it if you're doing this right and you're choosing the right project for you. And that might just be warm fuzzies. That might be what you're in this for. And that's great. I support that. But you are doing it for them as well. And they should try to respect you. And if they don't, you don't have time for that. Move on. There are millions of projects. Someone else will want your help. So let's sort of change pace a little bit. So we've been saying, hey, 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 dear listener, you want to get into open source. What if I'm a maintainer or what if I'm somebody who's a really, really focused adherent to my existing open source project? I love this thing. This is the only thing I care about. What could I do to make things better for people who might want to come on board, who people who might want to participate? So as a maintainer, you have already learned, one hopes, 
the stark reality of being an open source project maintainer. And that is you don't scale. You just (laughs) don't. You know what does scale? Documentation. Get all of that stuff out of your brain and write it down. I don't care if you do a bad job writing it down because that's better than nothing. If everything stays in your brain, then it makes it very difficult for people to start contributing and you will never get assistance. And every time somebody wants to help, they will ask you questions and they will be the same questions over and over again. And you will get so frustrated. No, I just want to get work done. So write it down, write documentation. That is going to be the force multiplier for your project right there, both in users and in contributors. It takes a lot of time, but you don't have to do it all at once. Do it in just stages, steps. Take five minutes here, an hour there, and just sort of start writing docs to help people help you. So it sounds like going ahead and and getting some of that documentation done even if you're busy, even if it's a lot of work, it sounds like it might be an investment in letting your future self take more naps. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Take more naps, go and see your kids' ball games, Um, just buys you a lot more time because you can start having other people help you with the work that you were doing all alone before. And that is such a relief when you start having people you know and trust help you maintain the project that they also love. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. So when you set out to write this book, did you have one message where you're like, wow, if folks forget everything else, I don't want them to forget this. What's sort of the one thing you wish you could scream probably politely, in the faces of folks sort of across open source. You don't have to be a programmer to contribute. That's the biggest thing. And that's, I think, going to help free software and open source software more than anything else. When we can throw our doors wide open and include more than just programmers, it is going to benefit the software in a way that we can't possibly imagine. And we will get new perspectives and we will get new users and it will be amazing. But thus far, we've been holding a lot of these people at arm's length and we need to stop. Do you have any ideas for ways that people can be and folks who are maybe programmers and folks who are maintainers can start being more accepting and start signposting participation in open source better for non-programmers? Well, starting by reaching out to people. This is the way you make people feel included and wanted is you ask them to be there. Don't expect folks to find you when you are the one who, as a maintainer, need more assistance in marketing, need more assistance in documentation. Don't just sit there at your desk going, God, why won't anyone come help me? No, go out and find the people. It's okay to ask for help. Go to the Write the Docs conference or Slack channel or any of these and say, hey, I have a project. I would like some help. Here are some issues. Or reach out on Twitter or Mastodon or whatever your flavor of social network is and say, hey, I have an open source project that I would like to get in front of more people. Are there any marketers who could help me with advice? It's okay to ask for help, but people aren't just going to seek you out because often they don't think about it and they have been held at arm's length for so long, they just might not feel welcome. And so they might be avoiding free and open source software. But if you tell them and take that step and tell them you are welcome and I need your help, they will show up. It sounds like the the sort of first step in moving towards this glorious, bright, and beautiful future might just be more awareness on the side of folks who are already in open source that you can benefit hugely from marketing, that your documentation probably needs some help. Just letting folks who are already here know, hey, those other people are out there and these are the things they can do for you and these are the things they can do with you sounds like a really useful first step. It is an immense first step, though, because it's not just a problem with free and open source software projects. They're not the only ones who don't have the awareness of what these other industries and other approaches, what they can do to help. Software as a whole has a very big problem with that. And they look down on marketers because they don't understand what marketing is 
And they also have been on the receiving end of far too many spam messages. and Oh, yeah. no, the emails. Oh, my gosh, yes. But marketing is really an amazing thing that is very useful. And documentation is an amazing thing that's very useful. And design and accessibility and considering other people. These are good things across the board. And InfoSec, you know, putting security front and center rather than duct taping it to the back end of your project at the end. This is stuff that across all of software we have a problem with. So if we can start solving it smaller, just in free and open source software, which is still a lot of people, but if we can start solving it at the project level in free and open source software, my hope is that that will start to ripple out and other parts of the software industry will start to recognize the value of other pursuits beyond just programming. This is fantastic. We're going to have to wrap up in a second, but if somebody was just like, wow, well, come on. Our listeners are clearly like, wow, this is the future. Where can I hear more? Because they're on first name basis with you now too. So where can I find Vicky on the internet? Uh, well, you can find me on Twitter, VM Brasseur on Twitter. I do tweet rather a lot. Uh, apologies in advance, but I am what I am. And also vmbrasseur.com. You can find me there, a link there to my blog and all of my writings and videos of all of the talks I've given over the years, um, most of which are on Internet Archive. Ah, I'm going to have to start throwing my talks on Internet Archive. I have an article that will show you how to do that. But if our dear listener, and me myself, because I'm clearly going to get a copy, absolutely needs a copy of this, is the book out now? The book is out now in an early release beta version. Oh, oh, how exciting. I know. It is It is very exciting. And it's also scary having people read a book that I wrote. I wrote a book. Oh my gosh, I wrote a book. But people are reading <laughs> it and that's also scary. But yes, you can go to Pragmatic Bookshelf and you can get it there. It is available in a DRM-free ebook right now. The uh, hard copy will be out, <gasps> we believe, between October 10th and 15th, somewhere in there. And of course, you'll be signing these at conferences, right? If somebody comes up to you with a hardback book, you've got to, right? Oh, I have to. Um, <laughs> but we've timed it such that, oh my gosh, I don't believe we pulled this off. But um, we've timed it such that we will have paper books in time to be at all things open, where my publisher, Pragmatic Bookshelf, is having a booth. And so I will be doing book signings at all things open. I love how casually you threw that out. You'd be like, oh, well, I'm going to be doing a book signing. It's, I'm kind of freaked <laughs> out by it. My first ever book signing, and I'm going to have to have my editor kind of talk me down. It's like, it's okay, Vicky. It's just a book signing. You're a rock star now. Uh, and just to recap, what was the title one more time? The title is Forge Your Future with Open Source. Forge Your Future with Open Source. Yeah. You can also, there is a shortcut URL, which is fossforge.com. So F O S S. F-O-R-G-E.com. And that will dump you right on the book page at the Pragmatic website. So you don't have to do any searching. Uh, Vicki, thank you so much for joining us. And for everyone listening, you could just hop directly to Fosforge.com. I've been your host, Jessica Rose. And thank you, dear listener. You may have noticed that we've dropped down to just one episode per week. Don't worry, we'll get the numbers back up soon. We're going to stay one episode a week throughout the summer, maybe a little bit into the autumn. Please check back next week. We'll have a brand new episode for you. Thank you so much for listening. 